first session for us in the year 14 of uh, walking with Whitman. It's nice to be finally necessary to go back and forth and look at the nice crowd that's here for the first one. Thank you very much all for joining us. I want to thank uh, Heather and the staff at the Walmart and Birthplace, Cynthia Shore, the director, for their many years of support for this program. And the other work I do is the poet and writer in residence at the Birthplace. Every time I uh, travel somewhere, I, I make a point to say I'm delighted to represent the Walmart and Birthplace here at uh, the John Steinbeck Center or, you know, Lowell celebrates Cadillac Festival or whatever. Um, we have uh, successful, I believe, because of all the work that you and I do together, managed to put together uh, a nice uh, uh, interconnectedness between the local poetry scene, the national scene, and, uh, and in between. And uh, it's a testament to, uh, to your willingness to work with me and to make that happen here at the Walton Birthplace at uh, Poets Building Bridges and other uh, venues that we do together. So uh, I want to put my hands together for you to thank you for all the good work you did for poetry. And if you want to join me and applaud it all, thank you very much for coming on How's the sound, all right? All right. I think you really have to stay right on the mic, okay? okay so, yeah, 14th year. And um, it's continued to evolve in very interesting ways, the Walking with Whitman uh, series. And uh, this year is no exception. Over the course of the, uh, over the course of this calendar year, you're going to see uh, people like Gerd Stern, the guy who was falsely accused of losing Neil Cassidy's letter over the side of a houseboat in Sausalito. You're going to see. Um, uh, Lucilla Trapazzo from Switzerland, Italian Swiss, Swiss who, uh, if anything, you know, is a person like I'm following as fast as I can in her footsteps in places around the world in the work that she does. So we're getting a rare experience of having her with us. We're going to have uh, Arad Corelli, who is um, a very prominent uh, poet originally from. Born in Harlem, raised in Harlem, and she's now a principal figure in the Bronx literary scene. And we're going to have Mo Singer, the self proclaimed king of jazz poetry in Paris. And uh, he's quite a character himself in his own way. So we've got a lot of very good people coming to, uh, to visit us and to read with. Let's see if I can do this from my hand. We've got Marie Lazella, the Paul Lord of Queen, she's going to be with us. We're going to have uh, Kate Kelly's going to be reading with someone. I'm not going to be able to do that. No, Kate, we're going to have George. Oh, Kat oh, and Peter. who's reading with, with Gerard Stennis? Kat George and Peter Galloff, he's from Freedom Cross. Maria Lazella, she'll be with us on Trapasa. Danny Schott. Danny Schott has been um, publishing beat poetry from New Jersey and doing many good things for, for many years, and he's going to be reading with Mo Seeger. Kate Kelly's going to be with Ryan Corelli, and then we're going to wind up in with Kelly Powell, Kelly Powell, who I expect we'll see you a little bit, as the open mic um, you know, leader for their final mm -hmm. program of the show. So I uh, lots to look forward to. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. We have with us today two exceptional features. One who uh, is local, because I mean, he's uh, one of the board of directors here at the World of Birthplace. And one who is a prominent figure in Florence, Massachusetts, especially, which I'll tell you about when we get to him, but uh, has tremendous roots in Brooklyn, which uh, he's going to tell you a lot of good stories about that, I hope. Um, but first, Robert Savino, who uh, you all know, everybody who's in the poetry scene here. On our album, is well aware of uh, good work that Robert's been doing for many, many years on behalf of poetry and his fine poetry of his own. In addition to being here at the Walton Birthplace, 
the uh, he's been uh, an organizer of many events, both within the poetry community outside of it. You know, sometimes they'll show up here and have to leave at 11 o'clock to get to run a bingo program down at the Constant Meeting, you know, Brew Meeting Lodge down in Brentwood. So he's all over the place. You know, I remember most um, uh, that uh, in our prime when we were still playing softball, they, softball as, uh, as, uh, as poets and writers every year, there was uh, two or three people that you had to stack the outfield for when they came up to hit. As a matter of fact, in his day, we would have to put three people in right field, one 450 feet out, one 350 feet out, one 250 feet out, so no matter how far he hit it, they could just throw it 100 feet, 100 feet, 100 feet. That was the only way we could keep him from hitting a home run every time he came up to bat. So uh, I don't know if you could still do that, but you could certainly hit home runs as a poet, so I hope you'll uh, enjoy the experience of hearing from Robert Sabine Musa. Please welcome him. I want to thank, I want to welcome you all here tonight. And George, I want to thank you for 14 years of walking with Whitman. 14 years of being the writer in residence here at the Walden and Birthplace. And all the support that you have given to the Birthplace throughout the years. And when I think of support and inspiration, I think of how I got here and who I am over the years. And we've all had mentors. And I, and I have two that stood out. One was Dan Murray, who was no longer with us. He gave me the first uh, boot in the butt and kept kicking so I wouldn't give up. And the other was George, who I've known for uh, since the 80s. <laughs> for a long time, a long time. And he's been there throughout, uh, throughout my career as a poet as inspiration and support. So George, I thank you for that. And it's probably safe to see if you're a poet and you're sitting out there tonight that George has touched you in some way too. So thank you, George, for all of us. And you gotta know how I feel being here, being in Walt Whitman birthplace, um, both as a board member and reading in Walt's house. It's just, uh, it's just unbelievable. It's a remarkable, remarkable experience. I'm looking forward to sharing the night with Howie, with Linda, and with all of you. I'm going to start by going back um, and read a progression of poems since the early days, um, although in, in recognizing how poetry has changed in both form and style. I don't believe the old poem should be put aside, should be left in a box in the basement, or down in the angles of a drop box without a way to float back to the top. Because the old poems are where you were at that time. It's your memory, and um, I think the memories should stay with you. So I'm gonna start with some old poems. One is first from my first chapbook. Fireballs of Illuminated Scarecrow. This poem was the output of a uh, workshop that focused on the Duende style of Walker, a personal, authentic, and life struggle, and it was a medical workshop led by George. The Volatile Day. No longer could I fool myself. This growth was not about to disappear. I dreaded this dark place and this doctor or any doctor in a black open college shirt with a gold hanging idol beneath his white lab coat. The needle emptied into numbness. The shiny scalpel blade reflected off the ceiling. The cut sounded like a dull knife on cardboard as he peeled back the skin my head to excavate, like a pit, like pitting an unripe peach, extracting the scent of consciousness. 
Blood spurts were absorbed in gore shrouds. There were unfamiliar faces in medical mumbo jumbo. Uninterpretable common sense and nonsense. I gazed up through an asylum-like window, each frame, an imagine, each frame of imagination a new wrinkle of destiny. <coughs> I looked up into an upside-down lake, an ancient lake, schools of cumulus canoes, white water rafting, waiting to take me by surprise, blood stained into the gulf of waves. <laughs> The next book in the progression was my first uh, collection inside the turtle shell. It was the second volume in all book books, Turtle Island series, which focused on the protection of Turtle Island, of Mother Earth, and of the experiences of its people. I'll read two from there. First one, also a true experience. The fifth law. When she mentioned room 504, I looked over at her. Do you remember me? She whispers, no. I was there, 1968. And there was this girl who came over to the men's side at night and left a number under my pillow. She had strawberry blonde hair and freckles, just like me. I was the guy who helped Catatonic Pete and cut his dinner pork from the bone. I was the guy who protected the screaming Vietnam vet from the palace lottery. I was the guy whose mother bought red Asian pajamas because I had none and meatballs on Sunday. I was the guy, she interrupts, sorry, but I don't remember. The only me memory I have of the fifth floor was the poet who would read to me, Blake's Tiger Tiger Burning Bright and Stevens on the Road Home. <laughs> then progressing into a time of business outsourcing, downsizing, merging, and um, people looking for a job when they're 59 or 60 years old and it's not quite as easy as it once was. This is titled The Interview. He wants to know more about me, beyond the employment history on the resume. But I tell him, I can't tell him much. It's recommended that I don't divulge that information to protect you from discriminating against me, which would make us a prejudiced society. However, in an effort of reasonable disclosure, I will tell you this. I was born in the year Beirut died, when citation won the Triple Crown, when the State of Israel was created and New York's Idlewild Airport opened. A gallon of gas was 16 cents. A gallon of milk was 87 cents. And dad could buy a home for seven grand. I served as an altar boy when Splitnik was launched. And though blessed, drank wine in fury to a grandfather babe with his hands and feet in the province of Chiedi. I served our country when Sergeant Pepper debuted and Ho Chi Minh refused to stop infiltration. I looked into a reflection of his startled eyes. Pinstripes gone and I'm sitting in my birthday suit. Scales are running up and down my back, my nose smoking, exhaling flames and tail oscillating. He praises my qualifications, promises to contact me in two weeks, and I wait in a dust, play, dust collection of resumes. <laughs> so the next two um, books were um, based on Italian, the preservation of Italian American, Italian culture and heritage. Kind of like the creation of Dante's Children. It was a collection of Long Island um, Italian American poets in the first issue and New York State Italian American poets in the second issue. There were bilingual collections and Italian American because I'm Italian, but I do feel that they're um, that each culture 
should remember their traditions. Because once those traditions are gone, all those old good memories are gone. So I'm going to read one from each, only in English. was the immigration of my grandparents to America. The wind at the end of the day. It was the wind at the end of the day rocking crowded ships at sea, steaming from Naples and Abuso, to Ellis Island in the New World. The family names were countries anglicized and for the assimilation, where immigrants apprehensive of sardine packed sanctuaries were quarantined by smallpox, processed and purged, toiled in dust clouds and dream. I was too young to remember these stories. Frog throated men speaking out of the other language. Handshakes, kisses, hugs, passionate men, even in America. Icemen, bankers, bricklayers. Grandfather was a factory worker, laboring to shape a living in New York City's galleries every day of Sunday. I remember Sundays, day of rest, church breakfast, chasing chickens through the garden while garlic splashes and sizzles in hot oil. Sunday will always be Sunday. For now, many memories were gone. An empty condo in Century Village, an afternoon sitting in a strange garden with grandfather. No chickens, no fruit, no vegetables, the wind bending the pine tree. It's the wind at the end of the day. So in the second collection, I uh, decided to go a little bit lighter. And basically this was, um, you best show up at grandma's house on Sunday. <laughs> Meatballs and a Sunday mandolin. The children are outside playing. Young girls drawing chalk squares on the sidewalk. The boy is engaged in stoop walk, hoping not to miss the nosing and bounce into the front door, setting off the adult alert. An army of women swinging wooden spoons. <laughs> Game over. The hour arrives, the boy is ordered inside for kitchen duty. And I get to grate the cheese. Careful not to shave calluses into the pecorino lamb mess. Go get caught stealing a meatball brown before it's in the sauce. Then we all sit down for the meal. The adults eat, drink, and laugh, sometimes speaking a language foreign to them, while the kids exile to the kitchen table and learn to behave. After the feast, and before the fruit, nuts, homemade dessert, espresso, and zed, milk and cookies for the kids, Il Padroni leads the elders in a musical interlude. Two violins, a mandolin, a piano, and accordion. While black sheep checks off sports scores on a palm-sized scrap of paper, and the kids are instructed to shout, Um pa pa on cue. Oh, how I couldn't wait for the long, how long the buys. Though looking back, though the days passed too fast, some of us no longer here to share in the space yesterday's Sunday film. <laughs> then I began to uh, <clears throat> hopefully get together my next collection, which is still hopefully coming soon, and in between the distractions and the procrastinations and procrastinations and distractions, I decided to put just a small chapbook, pocket-sized chapbook together of specifically just nature poems, and I'll read two of those. This first one was just about when the pandemic was coming to the end. Chameleon Day. Early one morning, I return to the lake for reflection. The mist separates it from me. 
Even the reeds have thickened to block my view of the bullfrog. I would startle to a kaplow. There were no dogs. There were no bicycle riders. Perhaps they'll be here later in the afternoon. <coughs> Soon the fog lifts and the sun breaks through. Three painted turtles climb onto a tree fallen from the last windstorm. Lines flow from the lead of my pencil joined by an artist who brushes the orange plumage into yesterday's oriole, a father and a son with a fishing rod and a tackle box filled with bobbins of hope. As an occasional mass pass, a masked family passing by, <clears throat> suddenly an ominous cloud hovers, reminds me of how tomorrow can turn toxic. Title of the book, title of the poem of the book, I'm not giving you one here. Shadows of trees create a man made trail. Shadows of branches and a breeze are reminiscent of jumping rope. I am enamored by the sights and sounds of the woodlands, and nothing is more contagious than the smell of fresh rain on daffodils. Somewhere the presence of crowds doesn't cross boundaries. Somewhere to witness a monarch butterfly land on my wrist. Somewhere to hear the bullfrog bellow, add bass to the sparrow's song, and a woodpecker notes on a cedar tree that fells a pencil from my fingertips. Along the way, along the path, I lift the turtle from the brush. It immediately withdraws into its shell. It's much older and wiser than me, and when I return it to the ground, it slowly walks away into the distance, a fallback to infinite regress. I discover this turtle to be me, something it doesn't understand, something others can't see. Imagine I'm not the only one here. Now I'm going to go on to stuff that may or may not end up in this next collection. First one. This first one was published in 2009, but the topic was an issue then, and it's more of an issue now. But now, unfortunately, includes many of the young. Son of a gun. Children circle the swimming pool, plastic pistols filled with water, handled to battle. Each squirt aims to soak an opponent. Dad laughs as he takes a stream between the eyes. Nice shot, son. No surprise when the dad takes his 12-year-old hunting, teaching the boy how to operate a pellet pistol, pick off squirrels and chipmunks. Well, he goes after big game with a big gun and a rapid fire trigger, angrier after each missed kill. Bullet shells ejecting high into a gunpowder breeze. The son learns well. A marksman in manhood, a better shot than dad. Now, the dad himself, pearl handle pistol, full clip in the handle, child in a belligerent barrel. <laughs> this one's for. Uh, treatment of soldiers coming back from the war, specifically from the Vietnam War, and many of them were judged. Who knows hunger? He sits on a side panel of a Westinghouse box. Tattered blankets cover his torn army jacket, the kind you find in racks in a surplus store. Each tipless gloved hand holds a flimsy coffee cup. One with four green grapes, brown with the stem. The other barely jingling, nearly empty of change, chilled by the constant draft from city foot traffic. Another beggar, I thought, shameless, hopeless, and sidewalk a semblance of offensive stench. Until I turned to buy a hot, salted pretzel and trip on the toe of well-worn boots. These were clearly on the issue, Vietnam campaign. 
I begin to remember more than I can tell. I was younger then, bitter, but not cold. He made eye contact. He opens his mouth as wide as he could and smiles a toothless smile. And from deep inside my pocket, I stuff his cup. He might have saved lives in this senseless war, returned only to be rejected by those he protected. This street corner here, Pobo, could be a hero. I begin to feel the chill. Plat platoons of passersby racing to catch the heat in homebound express, shuttled to avoid him without leaving a nickel's worth of hope for a single scrap of comfort. Through her granddaughter's eyes for Jacinda. She scribbles the colorful maze with her brother's gently used pencils, like those reminiscent of the 60s Venus Paradise color by number 50, where I first learned to stay within the lines. She has no boundaries drawn for me, imagines a line on the page with a black mane flowing in the wind to conceal a smile. I ask, why are there no tall brown trees, gray mountains, or red brick houses? Silly pop pop, with that stuff in the way you wouldn't see the ice cream truck. <laughs> <laughs> but by now, not most of you know, you know that I played softball, we played softball for a while, and I still do. Um, and, um, there's poetry in ball, baseball, football, sports. Um, that, uh, it kind of transitions to other meanings, and I, the next two are uh, written in that way. First one is titled Poet in the Outfield. Now, if anybody remembers the New York Giants and the Polo Grounds or the Brooklyn Dodgers and Evans Field, you'll be here. Poet in the Outfield. Emerson penned the shot in the first inning of the Revolutionary War. Though it comes hard and fast in a radio blast during the Korean War, in the ninth inning of a tie-breaking battle in the Polo Grounds, the battle of big guns, aces firing off rockets. Reese and Robinson drew first blood. Thompson sacrificed even the scores. In the top of the eighth, them bombs gave Sal the bottle of trim to take the lead. Then Dressen's dreaded decision. We leave Newcomb, but Bronco. Rocker set up pictures taken by Thompson who delivers the shot heard around the world. But what if the sign stealer didn't signal a pitch, losing the battle with his conscience? Fate might lie in the battle of a rookie, the same hate did, destined to be a giant heart stealer. Sports related, but really um, examining the human aging process. Immaculate conception, immaculate reception, sorry, immaculate reception. He would doze off watching Jeopardy. Swore days were shorter in the summer. Swore the snowman was a devil taking a bite from a carrot and placing the apple. And this winter was cold as ever when the thermometer never dipped below zero. He called the thermometer a dipstick, <laughs> like that belonging to his Oldsmobile, with less smiling. Awake before dawn, he'd ask for scrambled eggs from a mouthful of scrambled words, emphasize the lack of seasoning with bountiful expletives, then fell asleep before the morning mug caught in his empty. One night, startled by his own snoring and loud TV, he howled, I got this one. What is a Hail Mary? 1972, 30 seconds remaining in the game, Bradshaw goes to the air, deflecting off an opponent into the arms of Franco Harris, crossing the goal line into the end zone, and closes his eyes with a smile.
inside man. Sometimes I blame the years we were together. Other times I blame the years we were apart. I follow dusty footprints on a path I travel, not able to change history, not able to forgive myself for those lame excuses that kept me away. You wanted to hear me. You wanted to see me. Yet you were so wisely composed. I saw only a profile of whom you are, never aware of all that stirs within. And I was not much different. I learned the significance of a narrow path and how it creates a narrow mind, but too late. I look into your eyes in a photo on a table. Imagine your whisper waiting for me. But now you can hear me. Now you can see me. Now you know what's inside. Five Gloria came to town, angry with us, ripping roofs from home, strong enough to rip the roof hangers at MacArthur Airport and topple the WBLI radio station broadcast tower. I remain safe other than power loss until a high surge flooded the street, water spouting from sewer caps, finally breaching the foundation. It swallowed up my classic LPs, leaving me without the blues of T-Bone Walker and Sonny Boy Williamson. I often sit on a landscape rock at the water's edge of the Great South Bay in the illumination of a full moon to lighten the burden of being, watch mallet fish leap to avoid predators or catch a breath, and imagine fathoms of memories traveled in time buried beneath the mirror of reflection a mirror that never answers what or when to expect the next tragic event. The one morning mist of uncertainty arrives. Shoreline erosion, dunes, the dunes disappearing, homes flooding, while no one takes a deep enough dive into the salty mix to protect our island. Yet they know. They know. They look into the mirror in the presence of awareness and absence of feeling without a tear to shed knowing memories of tomorrow will not remain afloat. <laughs> Self-same at the finish line. On a, on a casual morning walk in South Florida, I was shocked to see a great blue heron pick a frog from a shallow stream between its pointed orange-yellow bill. That same afternoon, a water snake lunged from that same stream and locked jaws around a heron's neck, all during intermittent songs of the wood thrush. I first compared it to a Brazilian tribal practice, but then realized it might not be a fight to the death, but perhaps a self-guided proof of strength, not much different than boating in the playground. A sudden violent act, a need to prove domination, what the young fear reporting to the principal, what the young fear repeating to their parents. Did I mention I believe gender boards have squares of both truth and consequence? Opportunity to pass go and throw the dice. Opportunity to learn about life in harmony and even if it comes up snake eyes, the free turn will offer chance for change without consequence. Did I mention about the frog from the shallow stream that once slipped out of my cupped hands? <laughs> two more, last two. This is just an uncommon friendship, and, and I thank you, George. This is in this current issue of Poetry Night. A ray of hope. 6.58 a.m. Penn, Babylon to Penn. Number two express downtown. First stop, 14th Street. The crowd packs in like sardines. Two strap hangers kissing. 
three couples holding on to each other, 38 strangers engaged in electronic gadgets. The train arrives at Cortland Street. The doors slide open at the same spot. No one notices the smile of a lone commuter, except for Ray, playing a strung broomstick in an old wash basin on the platform. I drop some cash into his empty cup. He nods and drops four bars of the blues, the better high of the second cup of joe. This was my perk of the work week, the smile of the cup, the cash, the blues, for years of New York City rail travel. Until that morning, those doors slid open to an eerie emptiness on a platform. I'll close with this one to say um, personal favorite of lessons learned. Learning Latin. As language was necessary in high school, my choice was Latin. With no interest to speak it, but to engage in mythology. Mr. Stern was true to his name as an educator. Whenever I would step out of line, he would point his arthritic finger at me and howl, tell us, rota, spin the wheel. A punishment mechanism of numeric multitudes required to scribe Latin verse. And under my breath, I would mumble, unus brumo, lumo, mocking his physical misfortune. And at the ring of the bell of class standing to exit, I would shout, Ame Rumque Cano, of arms, and then I sing, which translated into 11th grade lingo as after class, we don't meet, they have to settle our differences. Years later, learning of Mr. Stern's passing, I bowed repentantly, my inner spirit whispering, Achista. We arrow me the ipso interim. Teacher, it was you who saved me from myself. Thank you. Let's hear it again for Robert. There's a, there's a concept of you know, there's a grateful mood. Things which are false associations that don't really have any meaning. In other words, any real meaning is saying, for example, somebody says, oh, you're from Missouri, I'm from Missouri too. And then there's nothing that happens after that because there's really nothing of substance, that connection. I raise that because um, in life, there are so many invisible threads which potentially bind us. If we, uh, if we know of them and if we uh, um, recognize their metaphorical or real impact on us, some of them we find that they have uh, impact on us because we attribute something to the connection and thereby give it uh, meaning. When I first uh, saw this guy in uh, Florence, Massachusetts, I was like, uh, I don't know what it is about this. I'm like, Aura? And he's like, this is the guy they hung out in the back of the school bus with and don't remember his face, but it was the same guy. I felt this connection. I didn't know what it was. And, but um, there's some people who embody their identity and their history, and they emanate it in some very special way. And Howie Feierstein is one of these people. So that I felt it immediately. I felt like this is a guy who probably uh, has my baseball cards in his uh, attic, and I want them back. But there are some other connections which, you know, may mean something, may not, may, may not mean something. There's a guy from Brooklyn who's up in Florence, Massachusetts, and is here in Huntington today. And um, in his most recent book of poems, he writes about 
the statue in Florence of Sojourner Truth, who it turns out, when she had the name Isabella Balfrey and was living in Chinatown and the Miller, the Millerite um, <clears throat> end of the world thing did not happen in 1840, the next month she packed her bags to went across the ferry, Brooklyn Ferry, and walked up Fulton Street as Isabella Balfrey ran into a Quaker woman and the Quaker woman asked her where she's going. She said, hey, I'm going to Northampton, Massachusetts to meet with the abolitionists out there, William Lloyd Garrison, etc." And um, the Quaker woman said, you've got to change that name. Isabella Bounce is just not going to work. So it was right there the, where the Jackie Robinson Parkway, the Murrah Parkway, starts in Brooklyn that, uh, at a well that she and this Quaker woman came up with the name Sojourner Truth. Well, Sojourner Truth continued on her way, came here to Huntington, took a ferry across to Connecticut, walked all the way to Northampton and on to immortality. Is there a connection? You know, you know I, I choose to make a connection. There's a metaphorical connection between the good works of people and uh, this thread which led her on a straight line through Brooklyn and through Huntington to Northampton. Just as in its own circuitous way, uh, there's a thread which brought uh, Howie Farstein from Brooklyn up to Northampton, Massachusetts, and now today down to Huntington. So I want to see if we can feel that, if there's something we can establish in our consciousness at this point. Even if you don't, you're going to have a terrific experience because this guy is a hell of a storyteller. He's got really great stories he has to tell in these four books here, so much so that he gets praised excessively by Martina Spada and, and uh, Alicia Ostricker, two people who read here at the birthplace, but for good reason, you know, because he is that kind of presence that they recognized in, the, in their comments about him. I was a guy that lives in Florence, Massachusetts, and if you know Northampton, you think of oh, Northampton as like, well, it's the center of some progressive, you know, miraculous progressive community up in central Massachusetts. But Florence, Florence is a different town from Northampton. Now, you can correct me if I'm wrong about this, but Florence is the kind of place where people line up to get into the liquor store a half an hour before it happened, before it opened. It's a, it's a working class town. It's got a lot of crazy, crazy characters, but I can understand why a guy from Brooklyn would want to go and live in Florence, Massachusetts. Because I did it when I went to visit Tommy Twilight, stayed in his house, and I went out early, and at night there, he was there lining up with the other drunks trying to get into the liquor store. So I know the kind of community this guy lives in. He breaks it in a lot of different ways. You can read the resume and everything, but I would just point out this one thing which I think is particularly important. Is that his work is a, so as a kind of co-editor or associate, I'm not sure what, of Cutthroat, which is a very, very important, influential, and high quality literary magazine out of the Southwest. He's been doing that for a number of years. So in addition to all his other accomplishments, he's a, a noted editor and more and more an essayist and almost a flash fiction writer as well. So without saying too much more, I will now introduce for your pleasure and entertainment and excitement, the fine Howie Firestein. in Out of Order. 
anchored to a spent daisy in the forge of continuous summer, an orange and black speckled butterfly had spun her silk pad, had shed caterpillar skin, had burst capsule chrysalis, and I named her Whitman and water and wind. Her forelegs, vestigial, held close to her body, and I named her fish and sparrow, and when she lifted with the sound of light rain, she flew beyond milkweed stalks, above a caution sign, and grooved pavement, unbent, unbridled, and I named her otter and fire, and when she rose among asters and comets, luminous, when she stroked through cloudless blue, unclosed, unbidden, I named her unmechanical. Now I call her mist and dawn. I looked knowing her gone, a pool of blue shade in her place. Okay, so this is from the first book from about 13 years ago or something like that, um, Dreaming of the Rain in Brooklyn. And this was kind of an introduction to the book and an introduction to readers. It's called, it has an epigraph from Louis Armstrong, Man, I am riffing today, <laughs> taking a chance on love. I don't want you taken in. I don't want to take it or leave it. I don't want you to take me lightly. I want to take you for a ride to the Lower East Side, to a ball game in Fenway, and later that night, Madison Square, then for hotcakes in a diner in San Rafael. I want to take you seriously. I want you to take me to heart. I want to take you where mountain laurel blooms, monarchs gather, Bats dark. I want to take you on the B-65 downtown bus, get off on Gates, turn down Fulton. I want to take you to Notre Dame's Lost and Found, to a minimalist exhibit in a maximum museum. I want you to take it to the bank. I don't want you to take my word for it. I want to take you in the market at St. John de Luth, in Quaker Cemetery, in Prospect Park in Momotaro, Noguchi's egg, high on a hill. I don't want to be taken to the cleaners. I never want to take you for granted. I want to take you to La Jolla tide pools, all the places we've never been, all the bad parts of town. <laughs> okay, another Whitman reference. This uh, poem has an epigraph. From Walt Whitman, I help myself to material and immaterial. No God can shut me off. No law can prevent me. The poem is called Hunger. Along the pink rock mesa fronting two brown hills, last spring's fledglings attempt song. I steal a flicker splash of fire sun glint on a kinglet's ruby crown. I take all that I can. Fear drives me to it. Some birders place mist nets around yards, catch incoming migrants, hold blue-winged warblers to their mouths. I gather feather and stone, hang Jerusalem cricket and clown beetle in the front window, dragging off all I can love. Greed spurs me on. From the newborn desperate to talk, I breathe evidence of fingers and toes, and from their necks, so goose-like they light the Rio Grande, I rifle a message to my mother about stars that go on like numbers forever. Then running down the wash, I heave the blood wood of your heart, make it my own. Without fear of consequence, I grab as much as I can hold, hunger, makes me do it. So it's been a long journey. It started with Brooklyn for 50 years, and then uh, the Berkshires of Western Massachusetts for, I think, 
four years and then Taos, New Mexico and Santa Fe, New Mexico and Durango, Colorado and then back to Florence now, Massachusetts. So a lot of things in the poetry touches on all of those things, all those places. This poem is a Western, a Western poem. It has an epigraph from Pope Gregory the Twelfth. I have not understood the world, and the world has not understood me. This poem is called The Extinction of the Black Rhino in Our Time, or Older Man Emerging from Flowers. The sun is white and earth so incomprehensible, so remarkably obtuse, sun rays reflect off muddy homes, half in the river. Until Nancy died, I hadn't grasped the significance when the flesh of our feet turns mottled. Minutes after the hurricane passed through, an inchworm yo-yoed from the clothesline. I heard a man being interviewed say, integrity is an algorithm. Is that like saying, Human beings are resilient? That's so repetitive. Besides, teratogenic products are widely available in every strip mall, and male frogs convert testosterone into estrogen, spawn fertile eggs thanks to herbicide-generated enzymes. More news, the tropopause continues to heat up. Rivers run brown with good dirt. But other times, Say when night clangs its heavy gate, or when morning's another step up dreams lighthouse. Is it possible to understand the world? 11,000 years into the Holocene, summer lasts longer, and still it ends too soon. But even as memory's rusted chain snaps, we continue to learn. Once in the cemetery of the abstract expressionists, a fireball streaked the sodden sky, painting you into being. I knew then you were promised, but not how long it would take to find you. Even though magnetic north is wildly unstable, sometimes I try recalling sheep in the middle of a road, gaunt men wielding wide sticks, high stepping through the flock. What the air outside my car smelled like, how loud their bleeding shuddered. Within my small circle, each of us talks in our own way, just as sparrows' flight differs from swallows. We ask more than life will give, seeking the story of my life and others. What we look for through love and delusion is ourselves. Above this unlikely page hovers a fugitive from summer's finish, a six-legged fly with crossed translucent wings bluish shell, narrow reddish head, and barrels at the other end, earthquake of jeweled flight, dazzle of deepest wonder. Tomorrow, most likely, we'll find it dead. All I want is to recreate it so you hear its buzzy song amid the plash of rain. second book, The Goose and Other Poems. It has a lot of meanings, The Goose, to me. I'm not going to go into it. But this poem is a Costa Rican poem when we took a little vacation. It's called Dominical. At 6 a.m., the men leaving the cab of a 4x4 four four that climbed the mountain prepared to begin the work of harvesting coffee beans. But in the middle of the stony, rooted driveway, bounded by breadfruit trees and panic grass, a fur de lance, known as terciopelo for its velvety sheen, an excitable snake, extremely venomous, extremely feckened, slithers toward them, broad, flattened head raised, and the men from the canton of Perez de la Don draw their machetes slicing the terciopelo in half, its young spreading out in the early light like stars blinking forth at dusk. Okay, this one is called 
and man's love. Man's love. If I could send you June's last breath in a country of poetry, Main Street, 9 p.m., starry blight of the funk gas station marking four-way stop, and loops of chimney swifts chattering Florence into twilight. If like a thrush I had two voice boxes, I'd sing you 200 songs, and as all the animals are younger than us, I'd swaddle 13 wild turkey poults in flax leaf, then speed them to your cove in the Sea of Cortez. If I could fit a black bear yearling into the corner mailbox, if I could tame one chippering bat, learn its tongue, if I could post you the inflorescence of this life, spathed and spadix both. Like silk moths, I have no mouth. There's one week left to live. Tent worms veil the wood. All I do is search for you among sugar maples. Any hour now, July, and like the clown sweeping up his shadow, I wrap each minute of daylight lost. As much as this is for old love, we'll never have to lo lose it again. It's also for new love. Sixty years it's taken to map this terrain of rise and slope. Everywhere I step in this tangled river valley, dinosaur footprints fossilize beneath my feet. I pluck the shallow beak of lace wing and sore fly. They flew off to you at first light. Okay, a short one from Out of Order again. And this one is for my daughter. Well, she just turned 50, but this is for her when she was, I guess, about a year old or less. I don't know. It's called Brando, her godfather. Conceived on the night we saw our last tango in Paris. <laughs> She's always been my child, that much I'm sure of. I was so much larger then, could hold her fullness against my chest, lying there in the sunken living room. My legs pulled up sweet, jack-in-the-box perched on my knees, a pyramid, a slide, and when I splayed them open, she tumbled down. I was roller coaster, rocking chair, slingshot, catapult. She was counterweight, payload, cannonball, curled tongue, snaking out her mouth resting on lower lip, joyous she was, over and over, hilarious, again, again. Love was that easy. Okay, this is a change of tone. Say it to my mom in a way. It's called In the Narrows, where I grew up in Brooklyn and lived by the Shore Road, by the by where the bay came together, and we called it the Narrows. In the Narrows. We sifted the contents of one plastic bag into another, saving some of her for our missing brother. Then we spilled her ashes into the sea, into the atmosphere, onto our shoes, and then we ate of her. We fed our mother to the eels and crabs and mermaids lurking behind the rocks along Shore Road, across from the traffic of the highway. We fed our mother to the tidal strait, linking upper and lower New York Bay. Her ashes spilled into the shallows, clumping into the wholeness she lacked. Black-headed gulls with darkened wingtips shrieking above her form. Coming together after seven years, we fed our mother's ashes to the wind blowing five feet above the deep while we leaned on the railing of the pier, of the pier watching waves carrying out to sea, widening, then compressing, returning her to Odessa. We emptied mother out of a plastic bag, only a name left, her journey just beginning. 
but I see her as my children will see me when I am powder mixed with earth. And as she prayed each Sabbath to three candle flames, for she was her father's daughter, haltingly we recited the morning's Kaddish, and then we ate of her, for we are our mother's sons. Something really important happened. 
It came out later that the Lord had revealed to the betting salesman that one day he prayed with a customer. I had moved west, leaving my matrimonial bed behind, and when I entered the sleep center to check out mattresses, this smiling drummer strode right up, hand offered in a shake, and said, you are the one. Jesus, I heard so much about winning America over to Christ. I told the guy I was a Jew and wanted one firm with some give my trip back and all, that it should be at least a queen, since maybe I'd find another to love. That seemed to reach him. He told me what the Lord had said and asked me to pray with him. I came in to buy a mattress. <laughs> Will this help? He assured me it would, and I got down on my knees on the stiff sisal rug. It felt good to get off my feet, and after a while I asked if a discount was in the cards. <laughs> Something really important is going to happen, said the salesman, and praise be, five minutes later I gave him my credit card, bought a combo mattress and box spring, slept like an angel that night. <laughs>
be pulling it right here. Get it done. Okay. Poem is called nine minutes and 29 seconds. In the first 60 seconds, I kept watch on the towering sugar maple. I counted limbs growing from its trunk and limbs growing from those limbs. I tallied 10. Then there were all the side branches to add. Night air outside the open window was cool with a subtle breeze. In that second minute, twilight showed the contrasting buff and black of a bobolink's head. I wondered how much Ben was left in the battle how it reached toward the risen moon, how it stretched beyond the roof. In the third minute, I saw palm-shaped leaves lengthening, aphids scaling veins. I wondered how much rot infested the bowl if carpenter ants tunneled through the stems. There was a quickening in the fourth minute. Early May fireflies lit up the street and multi-lobed leaves began to breathe. The sound was deafening. In the fifth minute, a garter snake coiled around the tree's base, then slithered through a thicket of saplings. I saw it flick its forked black tipped red tongue. I saw it retract it. In the sixth minute, a sapsucker began its rhythmic drumming. Loosened bark dropped to the black grass. Scolding house wrens rattled when a red-tailed shadow passed over. In the seventh minute, a spider was taken by a sparrow. Wind came up, and the maple's dense crown waved like cornstalks. Patches of blue sky slipped like ice through the night in the eighth minute. Then the ninth minute, when there were no longer any minutes, not the minute before or the second after, not the first spring migrant, not the last blooming aster, suffocation, Nothing o'clock. For nine minutes and 29 seconds, we watched the man cuffed and pinned to the pavement, repeating over and over, I can't breathe. We heard him call for his mama, the full weight of a cop on his neck, the man's breath extinguished. perfect sense, yet surely is absurd, given sunset, given gravity, given that our hearts grow larger. The number of spaces is unimportant, still questions ring more clamorous with each passing season. Where is the next space? How will it be filled? Who will name it? When we arrive at the cemetery grave already dug, mounds of brown earth encircle the hole. My brother in his suit and striped tie, chain pendant resting on white shirt. My brother in his coffin is lowered. Between us only blood, his death wish fiercer than mine. Now the earth is shoveled from where it came, suffusing the space. This makes perfect sense, yet is quite absurd given sunrise, given gravity, given that the heart grows bigger. And this is from my other brother, who's still alive. It's called For My Brother. <clears throat> I've always loved my older brother, and now, and not just because we share so much in common, father told me, you'll never make it. Said to him, that girl you're seeing must be a whore. <laughs> a red-tailed hawk trapped in the bell tower of a shuttered church on Hawley Street reminded me of our childhood. We needed an 80-foot ladder to extract us from that quasi-modo of need. I loved my brother, the brother who has survived, even when he pummeled me to our bedroom floor and sat on me. You could say I copied him in so many ways. At his oldest son's wedding, an old friend of his told me, 
You're more like him than he is. <laughs> I think she meant the timbre of our voice, but more than that, a style of walking, how our features match a shade of darkness. Trapped in the mesh covering the arched opening, its nape perched the top across the rafter, unlike Miles Davis soloing, turning his back on the audience, going in full view, al fresco, on pigeons nesting in the tower. Of course, copying someone can backfire. One needs to know who one is. Imagine the forlorn mockingbird forgetting its own song. I don't play favorites and so can't say I'm most partial to Monk. Not sure if my brother has favorites, though mom said once he was hers. Much remains the same since we sat up in bed comparing genital sizes. Bird sleeves already are beginning to bob like dowagers stitching the mud flats. Much too has changed. The great snows of New England have beat a retreat and black vultures have spread north. That was a time is gone. Now at opposite ends of America, I can picture him putting down his fork, stroking a hand through his pompadour, sweeping mom into his arms. Alan Freed spins short fat fanny on the kitchen radio. They lindy to the hallway where the rotisserie sits as the DJ shouts into the mic, banging one hand on a phone book, hitting a cowbell with the other. Yeah, Fanny, you talk, baby. Have we ever been as joyful as that? Okay, two poem one. Thank you. 